My name is Kirk Kleinholz, and I'm sales manager for Dynon Avionics. I'm also a CFII, an aircraft owner, and an amateur aircraft builder like many of you. I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to you for investing in your own pilot education and training by watching these videos. At Dynon Avionics, we're extremely proud that our Skyview system puts into your grasp an astounding array of features and capabilities, some of which still don't exist in many of the world's airliners today. While we work hard to make our products as affordable as possible, this remarkable capability doesn't come for free. With added features come added complexity, demands on the pilot's attention, and an implicit burden on every pilot who uses Skyview to learn how to use the system safely and effectively. During the last three years, over a thousand pilots have attended our half-day class of hands-on training for the Skyview system. With this new video series, we're excited to bring the contents of those classes directly to you. We hope you'll find these videos helpful and informative as you prepare to explore the world in your own flying machine. Thanks for watching. So welcome everybody. You're here to learn today how to use the Skyview system. Just pushing all the buttons, twisting the knobs, all right? Okay, so by way of introduction, my name's Kirk Kleinholtz. I'm sales manager here at Dynon Avionics. I'm a long-time pilot. Um, I've owned a few airplanes. I'm also a flight instructor. Uh, we talked about the fact that Bob is my second in command. He's running the display up here. It's projected on the big screen. Uh, it's paused right now, but when I take it out of the pause mode, it's going to fly just like you'll see it in your airplane. And we'll spend a lot of time focusing on that screen. Okay, my flight plan for today. Uh, again, my objective is to teach you how to use Skyview on the ground, set it up for taxi, get ready to fly, how to use it in flight, all the basic features, and many of the advanced features. Now, here I've said understand all displayed information. That's pretty broad scope. There's some stuff that we're just not going to cover, but everything on the primary flight display page, when we're done today, I should have talked about every piece of data you see on that screen. And if I haven't, you need to ask me, okay? If I miss anything, ask me. When we get to the end of the day, I'm going to circle back and say, did I cover everything? And you'll be on film saying yes or no, right? And then that's how my annual bonus is determined is whether I really covered everything. <laughs> Some of you may know that the autopilot has, can have two separate menu systems, what we call the simplified scheme and the expert scheme. Today I'm going to cover how to use the simplified menu. The advanced autopilot has many features that you might find useful, but it is more complex to understand and to use. If you don't intend to make use of those features, it's, it's not worth the complexity of using the more sophisticated menus. It just makes it more challenging to use. So I'll expose you to some of those menus, but I'm going to focus today on how to use the simplified autopilot menu. And again, if you're not planning on installing at least a roll servo, then we're going to have a little intervention sometime during the day. Why is that? Well, if you bought Skyview, you own the autopilot controller. It's in the, it's built into the, the EFIS itself. The only cost of adding autopilot capability is the cost of the servos themselves and they're $750 each. Now, I don't actually care whether you put a pitch servo in your airplane. If you trim your airplane in pitch and you nudge the stick, it'll oscillate, but it typically won't diverge. In roll, that's a different matter, right? You, my wife won't even point at things on the left side of the road anymore when I'm driving. Why? She says, honey, look over there. That's where I go, right? Same thing in the airplane. If you're looking over there and your hand's on the stick, you actually will tend to drift that way. And if it gets bad enough, if you're, if you're headed to Martha's Vineyard on a foggy evening, your plane might start spiraling down. So I beg you to at least add a roll server to your system. I think it's the most compelling safety device you can add to the airplane. If you've been flying airlines your whole life and say, I don't want to use the autopilot, fine, don't use it. But if you ever want it, it's awful good to have. Most of you, how many of you carry a first aid kit, right? I hope you've never used it, but you still carry it, right? Just in case. Boy, at the very least, you should think of a servo as just more compelling than the first aid kit. It might prevent you from ever needing to use your first aid kit if you use the roll servo right. 
I have a few soapboxes through the presentation, so just be ready. Right. And then I'm going to show you the basics of using the, the system to navigate VFR, using heading bug to orient yourself, using the autopilot, and so on. I'm not going to cover IFR. I am an instrument instructor. We can cover some of that offline if you like. If, there's, if, you, if you've got a burning question that relates to IFR, go ahead and ask it. I'll either say, well, let me cover that real quickly, or I'll defer the question till later. And I'm not going to cover every single feature. I try and cover all the most important stuff. Those of you in here today, you're going to get the benefit of a lot more material than I usually co cover, because we have more time today. There's going to be a few things that I'll cover quite quickly. When we get ready to discuss flight planning, how to construct a flight plan. Have you all used some kind of a GPS navigator before? You've built a flight plan, whether it's on a portable or a G uh, iPad or something like that. Not. You have not? No, but I've got this fancy GPS. Okay. Thing with the airplane. Yep. Well, I'm not going to teach you how to use that one. I am going to show you how to use the flight planner in Skyview. In Skyview, you have to trust me, it has all the same features in your other unit. They just do things differently. But the concepts are the same. And so most of you have experience with that. When, it, when we get to that section today, I'm going to slide in place of Bob, and I'm going to take you through it very quickly. Because I know from experience, if, if I let you follow down button by button, it, it just takes us too much time. So I will expose you to all the, the aspects of developing a flight plan, adding waypoints, deleting waypoints, and all that. But we'll go through really quickly. Dave? David? Yeah. Within the first 30 seconds of starting your engine, what number should your oil pressure be? He's just shaking his head. Who knows the number for their oil pressure? 70. 70. 60. 60. So now I got a whole bunch of numbers. That's almost worse. So Paul said 70. So I'm giving Paul a flight review, hypothetically speaking. How do I num know if that number's right? 70. What do I got to do? I can see it on the gauge, but now I got to open up the POH, flip to the engine chart, find 70. Doggone it, the chart doesn't say 70, it says 60 and 80. And now I got to interpolate. You, how many of you flunked that in math class? Interpolation. Basically, my computer is having to go through a whole bunch of steps to make use of what is otherwise a very precise piece of information. Right? But what color should it be? Green. Green is good, red is bad. And that's analog data. And by the way, this is an analog computer. And this computer is optimized to make use of analog information. We can make thumbs up, thumbs down decisions with one cycle of the computer. Green is good, red is bad. If it's yellow, eh, I don't know for sure, but I better pay attention. So in flying, many times we don't need absolutely precise data. We need enough information to help us make a better decision sooner. And generally speaking, analog data tends to be better for that specific purpose. Now there's other times when you want very specific information. Setting your manifold pressure for crews, one example, holding a precise altitude. Some of you may be intimidated by the fact that there's a huge amount of digital information on these new systems. And it is a digital computer that derives all this information. But one of the things I need you to take away today is that there's more analog information up here than you've ever seen before. There's more digital information too, but I'm more excited about all the analog information we can see, show you. For example, the synthetic vision, the, the digital presentation of the terrain in the background of the primary flight display. I can't stress to you how important that is. Any of you ever flown a Mooney? That's like looking out a Mooney window. If I reconfigure our screen up here, now on the big screen, yeah, that's different. But if you're looking at Bob's little display here, that's about the size of a Mooney windshield in an old whatever, right? But in a very real sense, this analog information, you've never had that in a six pack before. It's a recreation of the world outside the window. So anyhow, please don't be intimidated by the digital aspect. I'm gonna show you when the digital information is really important. And I'm really gonna focus on the analog information because there are pieces of analog data on this system that may save your life in a handful of critical situations. And I'm more excited about that part than all the digital d data combined. Transition training, I can't thank you enough for being here. There's an astounding amount of capability in these new systems, 
But like every other tool, especially in the cockpit, if you don't learn to use it, understand it, it can be a detriment. So you're going to hear me talk about what I call, uh, I use the term cockpit resource management. You've all heard that before. Generally, we think of that as, as crew coordination. In class today, when I talk harp on cockpit resource management, I'm really talking about using the features in Skyview to your best advantage, changing the screen layout for the appropriate phase of flight, and so on. But I do have a, a slide just to kick it off again. Here's a, it, it, an interesting feature coming. There's your warning. Hopefully you've all seen this before. There you go. So that's cockpit resource management, right? The question is, who was PIC? Was it is it Cliff Robertson on, in the pilot seat? Is that what? Yeah, the Duke is always. That's one way. Yeah, the Duke is just always PIC. So yeah. Is that his name, Robert Stack? Okay. So anyhow, let's not let it come to that. I'm hoping that before you start pounding on the screen, you remember the buttons I showed you how to push, right? All right, so carry on. Bob, did you do that? We're doing unusual attitude. Okay, unusual attitude. Okay, we'll just pause for there. Okay. Need a break yet? Can I keep going? All right, we're going to start right in. And the first place I'm going to start is the knobs. You got two knobs, left and right knobs. And if you haven't been fiddling with things, your left knob, notice on the big screen, this is the label that appears around the knob. The parentheses says that's a function label for that knob, and it should say HDG for all of you. Does anyone not say HDG above that left knob? Uh, I'll change you guys back real quick. Okay, so if it says HDG, what do you think happens when you rotate the knob? Do it now. Rotate the knob left and right, and you should see the heading change. On Bob's screen up here, there's a blue bug on the perimeter of the directional dry roll. That's the actual heading bug. At the, six, at the seven o'clock position, there's a digital value of the, the heading bug value. Now on all of yours, remember the simulator seems to be following as if the autopilot were flying. But the essence is rotating that knob left and right changes the bug value. Yep. Now shift your attention back up to the big screen for now. You'll get a chance to do this later, but I want to show you a couple examples of using that knob for other, in other contexts. Here I'm looking at the list of nearest airports, and I'm using my right knob in this case. When I rotate the knob, it moves that cursor up and down. Now this particular behavior is context sensitive. It, in some lists, rotating the knob will move the cursor up and down. But there's at least one other list where it doesn't work like that. You're going to have to learn that, and you'll see an example of that in just a minute. And then there are other places where, in this case, I'm going to put my cursor here. Rotating my knob now will cycle through the alphameric character list. Because I, I know it's going to do that because I have a single character highlighted with my cursor, and then rotating the knob goes through there. Okay? Now... We're going to go back and look at your right knob on your sky view. Most of you, it should say map. Yes? So what happens when you rotate that right knob left and right? Look at the map screen. Go ahead and do this for me, Bob. As you rotate that knob left and right, you're changing the scale. You're zooming in and out on the map. Okay, so pretty simple. You rotate the knob, zooms in and out. Now we're going to switch back to the left knob, if you will. The knobs have another physical action, and that is they work like a joystick. You can rock them left, right, up, or down. And go ahead and do that with the left knob. I'd have you click it either left or right. And what you should see happen is above the knob, you should see a menu open up. Now rotate the knob. When that menu is open, can you move that cursor in that list up and down by rotating the knob? No, you cannot. This is that exception where rotating the knob won't move the cursor vertically. Why is that? Well, because whichever of those values is highlighted, that's the function for that knob. And rotating the knob will change the numeric value of the function, the heading bug, altitude bug, vertical speed bug. 
right? So hopefully you're saying, well, how do I move the cursor up and down? Did you try clicking the joystick up and down? Do that. So click the knob left or right if necessary to open that menu. Now click the knob up and down, joystick fashion. And that's how you move the cursor up and down through that list. Is that making sense? Now, I'm going to have you focus on the big screen because this is one of those features where if I show it to you first, it'll make a lot of sense and then you can come back and try it again yourself. So everybody focus down here in the lower corner. When I open up the menu, I click the knob left or right, the menu opens. If I want to change the barrel assignment, I can't just twist the knob. I have to move the cursor up to barrel. There it is. And here's my barrel value under the altimeter. And as I rotate the knob, because barrel is highlighted, I'm changing that value. Yes? Now I'm done setting my barrel. Are you guys focusing up on the big screen here for me? Once I've changed the barrel, if I stop touching anything, after six seconds, the menu disappeared. But notice the label for the knob. When it, it timed out, we say, but now the knob is assigned to barrel. And what happens if I just grab the knob? It's, if I just rotate it, it's going to change the barrel. Now some of you are saying, hey, that's fantastic because I get a lot of barrel changes. I want to have a knob permanently assigned to barrel. Now this is a cockpit resource management issue. If you have a single Skyview display and you don't have a, our optional knob module, so you have, now you have two knobs in your system. And any time the map is on screen, one of those knobs is going to be dedicated to the map function. We'll cover that in a minute again. You only have one knob. Do you really want that single knob to be dedicated to barrel? What if you get a heading assignment or you want to set the heading bug? You reach over and twist the knob. Ah, oh, geez, I changed barrel by mistake. Well, here's the deal. Barrel is the one value in my experience that we rarely write down on a knee board. We write it down when we copy the ATIS and then we do like Ron Popeil says, we set it and forget it. If you get a barrel assignment in flight, you would set the barrel but you rarely write it down, and, you, and more importantly, you don't even store it in short-term memory. Now, if you fly IFR with me, you write down everything. Before you change the heading, before you change the frequency, you write it down on your knee board, and then you change it, including the barrel. So what I'm telling you is because of what I call the failure mode, the failure mode of inadvertently changing the barrel is more detrimental than the failure mode of inadvertently changing heading or altitude, for example, because we tend to store those values in short-term memory. If the autopilot's flying, things are going to start changing. If, if you didn't change, intend to change the heading bug, but you did, the auto, the, and the autopilot's flying, it's going to turn, right? And you probably remember what heading you were intending to fly. My personal standard in my cockpit is when I change the barrel, it, it, oh, if I were starting from a heading assignment on that knob and I get a barrel change, open the menu, click up to barrel, enter my value, and then I click the knob back down to heading. I can either wait for it to time out or I can force the menu closed by again clicking left or right. That's my cockpit resource management. In my cockpit, the knob will always be assigned to heading on that knob. If I need to use it for something else, I'll change it momentarily. Okay. Now, I can't say what's right for you, but I can stress that you need to have a standard cockpit layout. Find out what works for you. If barrel works best for you, fine, but I say learn it, know it, live by it. Right? Make sure that's your standard. If I heard you right. If I've got it on barrel at some point, it's going to reset itself back to the heading. No, 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 no. When the menu is open, whichever value is highlighted in that function menu, after six seconds and the menu times out, it assigns to the knob whichever value was highlighted. It will, now, now that the menu is closed, it will never spontaneously change with one exception. I'm, later on in the day, I'm going to talk about touch gestures. Uh, Bob's display up here is a touch screen, and I'll show you how to do some of these things using the touch interface. Back to the big screen, I'm going to show you a couple other uses of that joystick. I'm going to go back to my nearest list. You saw me before rotating the cursor to move, or rotating the knob to move that cursor up and down. I can also use the joystick action. When I click up and down, in all vertical lists, the joystick action will always move the cursor up and down. Rotating works in some lists, but not always. But the joystick action always moves the cursor up and down. Now notice at the top here, I have what we call a secondary cursor. The main cursor is in white. There's a blue cursor up here. 
and we have what we call tabs across the top. How would you suppose we move from tab to tab? In that case, I click the cursor to the right and it highlights each successive tab. You'll get a chance to do this again later too. You can follow along if you want. Uh, elsewhere, you'll find in the system that there's a list and we want to choose something. In the Skyview system, there's no enter key like on a computer. So in some lists, when you've highlighted something and you say, I want to choose that, we're going to use the joystick action. We'll click it to the right and we'll make a selection in that way. It's the equivalent of pressing the enter key in, the, in a computer system. Okay, now are you ready to switch back to the right knob? Hopefully your knob still says map above the knob. And go ahead and do this for me, Bob. When you click the joystick right, left, right, up, or down on the map, what happens there? Click it. Don't just rotate it. You want to click it left, right, up, or down. And what do you see happening? It's, it's, we call that panning. You're now in the panning mode. It's the digital equivalent of moving your finger across the map to explore other areas that you wouldn't otherwise see on the map. That all makes sense? Okay, now when you went into the panning mode, a couple things changed. A black box appeared at the top of the screen and there's a little round, looks kind of like a bomb site or a reticle, uh, a, a cursor that flashes. Okay, and that's how you know you're in the panning mode. So now I need you to focus back on the big screen for me a moment because there's a couple concepts that are really critical for you to understand about the panning mode. So first of all, I'm going to exit from the panning mode and I'll cover that in a minute. Here's my airplane near this airport. When I click the joystick in any direction, there's my cursor right on top of my airplane. There's the black data box. What does this data box say? Well, first of all, there's some data in Magenta. Magenta refers to GPS derived data. So the Magenta copy of the, of the cursor says, oh, that's, that's GPS position. And the Magenta data here gives you the latitude, longitude position of the cursor, not the aircraft. Now, it just happens that it's lying over the aircraft right now. But as I move the cursor, you'll see that that lat long position changes. Okay. Here's my airplane here. There's the map, uh, the panning cursor. There's some white information, 335 degrees, 6.4 nautical miles, three minutes. Those values tell me the trans, how do, would I get from my aircraft position to that cursor location? Well, I would, from here, I would need to fly a heading of 335 degrees for three minutes at my current airspeed, and it's this many miles, okay? This value, there's a magenta value and a white value in the middle. Those are altitudes and those relate to terrain. If I were to pan up into this area, the magenta tells me the absolute height, MSL, of the terrain that lies beneath the cursor. If I move the cursor, you'll see that magenta value changes. I'm over some high terrain there. If I move it out here, that terrain there is only 350 feet MSL. The white value is the difference between the height of that terrain underneath the cursor and the height, the altitude of my aircraft, wherever my aircraft is. Okay, so that means if I was planning ahead and wanting to know, can I cross over this terrain? Well, that ridge right there is 1,200 feet below my current altitude. So that's a comfortable crossing altitude, but I might not want to go over this terrain, right? Because it's only 632 feet. So that's how you'd use the cursor in that regard. Now, a couple other concepts, and here's where I get to the really, really important stuff. Really important. If I stop the cursor here, notice it, well, actually, let me stop here for a second. It starts flashing, but nothing else changes. When, it's, when I've paused and it starts flashing, it goes into what we call the select mode. And if there was an object underneath the cursor to be selected for me to tell you something about, it would select that object and you'd get some information. But there's nothing there, it's just a hunk of land. What if I move the cursor into this airspace here? I stopped moving it, it went into its flashing, meaning it's in a select mode. And by the way, it did select something. See this airspace boundary? It selected that airspace and it brought up a data block that says, hey, that's the Seattle area class B. The floor is 5,000, ceiling is 7,000 feet. Okay, now here's something interesting. 
Notice that I rotated the knob and it, remember how rotating the knob lets you zoom in and out on your map. But I want to change, show you one other example. What happens if I pan into an area like this? And now I stop. It's in the select mode. There's a ring that defines that airspace as the Everett Class D airspace, surface of 3100. I want to zoom out to take a better look. If I rotate the knob, it doesn't zoom. Why is that? Because there's more than one object underneath the cursor, and we have to have a way to let you pan, uh, scroll through the list of selected objects. So in this context, when there's more than one object underneath the cursor, Notice that on the, on the data block, there's a green arrow. That green arrow says, hey, there's something else there you want to know about. If you rotate the knob, it won't pan, or I mean, sorry, it won't zoom out. It will select among those two alternative objects. Okay, so by the way, then you're saying, well, well, Kirk, how do I zoom then? If I can't rotate the knob in that case, how do I zoom in and out to see the whole scope of that airspace? As long as the cursor is in flashing like that, it's in the select mode. To get it out of the select mode, you have to, what, click the joystick to make it start panning again. If I click it one click, it stops flashing. I only have one second to do something. If I click it once and I don't turn fast enough, I'm still in the select mode. If I click it and immediately rotate the knob, that lets me zoom in and out. So if you want to try that on your own displays, you go ahead. But I hope you got those concepts of how that works. Any questions about that? Did I lose any of you on that? The issue of panning and zooming and selecting an object? Nope, didn't lose anybody. Or else you're so focused on your own displays. The other one, you go right, just turn it, or turn it, turn one click. Is that making sense to everybody? You've used other EFA systems, Paul, have you? Okay. Is any, has anybody else used other glass panel systems? Does this, is this similar to your other experiences? Okay. Well, you're all going to walk away thinking this is the only way to do it, and as a consequence, it's absolutely the best way to do it, right? That's a good audience for me to have. Okay. I, just this one feature. Bob says, just learning this one feature paid for the price of the class. So first of all, I hope you'll all leave getting your money's worth for a class that costs zero. I can do better than that. But you're absolutely right. There's a handful of features in these systems that they might save your life. They might help you avoid a, an airspace violation. On the other hand, if you don't know about how to use the features or misunderstand them, they can lead to opposite consequences. Okay. There's another function of using the joystick action, and Bob, will you use that left knob? I'd like you to reset the knob to the heading function. Highlight heading. Now click the knob and just hold it left or right. Press it to the left or the right. He's holding it to the left. And did you see what happened? Let, it, let off and let do it again. Hold the knob to the left. And on his screen, if he holds it, click to the left, it says hold to sync. What does that mean? If, if the heading function was highlighted, as it was, and you hold the knob over to one side, or left or right, for two or three seconds, it synchronizes the value that's highlighted to whatever your current value was. I'm going to show you again. I'm going to rotate. Here's my heading bug. If I click that knob and hold it to the left, it will synchronize and it resets the heading bug to whatever my current heading is. And it works the same way for if you're using the altitude, the, the vertical speed bug, the indicated airspeed bug, all of those will synchronize the bug to whatever your current value is. Now what if Barrow is the highlighted uh, item? Uh, it says hold to reset Barrow. And what did it reset it to? Did you see what flashed up there? Do that again, Bob. Hold the sync. It didn't give me a value, it gave me the airport identifier, KPAE. Well, that's an interesting question. So there's a chart, you're not gonna be able to read this all in here, but in the manual we define this, and this is something you need to understand. In the case of barrel, if we give you the ability to automatically choose a barrel setting, the best choice varies based on context. So 
one thing to keep in mind is if you don't have ADS-B receiver installed, we don't know a lot about what the barrel should be, so we give you two options. If you're on the ground and you synchronize the barrel, we set it to whatever GPS altitude the GPS receiver says. So I'm sitting on the pain field, it's 595 feet. If I synchronize the barrel, it's going to set a barometric pressure setting necessary to give me, and actually I gave you the wrong example. I said 595. That's the MSL altitude of where I'm sitting on the runway. But hopefully you've experienced that GPS altitude can and will be different than the actual, if you're standing on a mountain peak, you have a GPS receiver, the chart says that peak is 10,000 feet, the GPS altitude might say 10,200, it might say 11,000. It depends on atmospherics, the positions of the satellites. So in this case, if you're sitting on the ground, our only external reference at that moment is whatever the GPS altitude the receiver is giving us, and that's what we synchronize to. If you're in flight, and you have no ADS-B weather at your disposal, if you in flight and you synchronize, we're always going to set it to the standard pressure setting. It's not may not be the right one, but that's the best we can do. Now, if you have the ADS-B receiver installed and you're actively receiving weather data, we've got a lot more information at our disposal. If, the, if you're near an airport, and here we're near Payne Field, so what we do is you're syncing, you say, I want you to synchronize. We look up the ADS-B weather current reported barrel for that station, and that's the value we put in. Pretty cool. So there's three, if you're on the ground, same, again, we still use the GPS altitude. If you're in flight, we use the, the reporting barrel setting for the nearest airport, and uh, there's some others, other alternatives. If there's no nearby airport, we do this. And by the way, if you're above 18,000 feet, again, we automatically set it to standard barrel. Most of you aren't going to be above 18,000 feet. Does that make sense? So you're not going to retain all this, but if you intend to use that sync feature, you need to go back into the manual and make sure you retain that. Ah, going back to the map, go, go back to the map knob and click again to make sure you're in that panning mode. So you have the black bar across the top, you've got the flashing cursor. I was waiting for one of you to ask me, well, how do I get out of the panning mode? And nobody did, so you must not care. Again. There's one additional mechanical function of the knob, and that is to press it straight in. Push the center of the knob straight in. Don't push it real hard. Just push it till it clicks. And if you've done that successfully, you should exit from the panning mode. You'll know that because you, you, the cursor disappears. You'll see your aircraft symbol. The black box disappears, and now you're back at the normal map presentation. But why did I say if you've done that successfully? Why am I so skeptical? It's not that I think you're not up to the task. It's because in turbulence, you might be trying to press that knob, try to push it straight in, and when turbulence hits, you might accidentally click it to the left, right, up, or down. So if I'm doing that, and I'm in the panning mode, and I'm trying to get out, each time I push it, oh shoot, it keeps rocking to one side or the other. So that feature can be difficult to use when it gets bumped in the cockpit. And I'm going to cover that whole concept in a little bit more detail later on when I start ta talking about the touch gestures on the touch screen and how that works. Just know that if the black box doesn't dis didn't disappear, you're still in panning mode. We covered this slide. Are we ready to go on to the buttons? Any more questions about the knobs for now? If you panned off and you want to get back to your position, <coughs> so you so good. Oh, good question. Okay, I did forget to cover something. So anytime you enter the panning mode, the cursor starts out at your aircraft location. So if I, if I click once, I'm in panning mode and there's my cursor right at my position. Now as I pan away, the aircraft's out of view. If I press the center of the knob, it goes back to the aircraft position. Now let's say I want to return to that area of the map that I was invest investigating previously. If I use the joystick to go back into the panning mode, the cursor is going to start out where? Right at my position. But in this case, if I use the, if I press the center of the knob, it will jump the cursor back to my last panned position. And I use that quite a bit in flight. You know, you're, you're investigating to find out what airports have services, where you're going to make your next restroom break, so on. Then you need to get out of panning mode for whatever reason. This is a handy way to get back into the panning mode.
Okay. Now that center press of the button does change in some contexts, and I'll show you get again. I'll show you that a little bit later. Okay. So if no more questions about the knobs, we're going to switch now to focusing on the buttons.